hey, we're core organizing a live event at the San Francisco Blockchain Week. It's called SF Blockchain Epicenter, and it'll be October 8th and 9th at the Hilton Union Square. You can come see members of the Epicenter team and a lot of familiar faces from the show. Uh, there are reduced rates for developers, and you can learn more at sfblockchainweek.io. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Dutch X, the fair and secure decentralized exchange platform by Gnosis. To learn how you can build dApps which leverage Dutch X's liquidity pool, visit epicenter.tv slash Dutch X. And by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastien Couture, and today I'm very pleased to have with me uh, Alan Day, who is a science advocate at Google uh, at the Singapore office. Uh, we met in Singapore a few months ago when I was traveling through Asia. And at the time, he told me about this really interesting initiative, uh, which I, I hadn't heard about, uh, but that been, had been uh, up for a few months, which was that Google had actually added the Bitcoin, uh, entire Bitcoin transactional data set to their cloud infrastructure and was on the cusp of releasing also an Ethereum data set. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I vowed to have him on at some point so that we could discuss this. And uh, in, in August, Google did, in fact, release their Ethereum data set uh, on, on BigQuery. And so I'm here with Alan today to talk about, uh, about all this and other things. So, Alan, thank you so much for having on, for coming on. Yeah, sure. It's really my pleasure. Happy to be here. And so, um, you yeah, know, before we get started, let's talk a bit about your background. Uh, your your PhD is in human genetics. Talk a bit about your journey. Uh, where did you where did you come from, and how did you end up at Google working as a science advocate, uh, putting blockchains in uh, big data sets? Yeah, uh, I've been working with computers since I was uh, a little kid, and um, when I went into my as I as I was moving through school and eventually ended up in a doctorate program, I was I was combining. Uh, computing and, and biology all the way through that. And so that led me into um, an interdisciplinary field called bioinformatics. Um, and that uh, involves working with distributed systems uh, for doing scientific computing, as well as, um, you know, large data sets and uh, computer science and statistics. And so I, I was uh, becoming something that's now called the data scientist before the, the title really existed. Um, a lot of these people come from physical sciences. And so, you know, once I once I'd acquired that skill set, it, it was quite easy to apply it to to other disciplines. And so I could see that there was something interesting happening with these um, uh, blockchain data sets. And so I decided to start looking at those and applying some of the, the same techniques and methods that uh, I'd learned for analyzing biological networks to analyze these uh, new types of financial networks. So one one thing that I think is, is sort of interesting, and I think I think Meher, uh, my co-host. Has often talked about this is uh, this idea that blockchains and biological systems um, are somewhat similar, or they have common characteristics. Uh, in that, uh, you know, a blockchain can uh, can can mutate and can fork and you know have a sort of new evolution within its uh, within its life form. Uh, can you maybe give us your take on what your thoughts are on this? Do you do you find that there are similarities between the way blockchains evolve? Uh, to the way you know biology has evolved. Yeah, certainly. Um, the, uh, the the most the most uh, direct parallel is the forking that happens between projects, where um, one project may decide to change the operational rules for how the consensus works, for example, or the block time or block size or something. Um, and that's very similar to if you were to have a mutation um, that caused two populations of uh, in, in individuals from the same species to become different species. So a speciation event 
is the equivalent of a, of a fork. Um, also, you know, if you look at the smart contract platforms and having smart contracts stored on chain and these things have some function um, that's made available to any blocks that are added after the smart contract was added, there's some additional effects that are possible as the, as the blockchain evolves. That's also related to you know, adding new functions into a genome, for example. Yeah, there are certainly some parallels. Do you know of anyone who's you know, doing any research on this and um, that is sort of exploring this at a much deeper level? No, but there was a, there's something interesting that I encountered um, So uh, from a friend of mine. He, his name is uh, Daniel Suarez. He's a sci-fi sci author. And um, he recently uh, uh, published a book called Change Agent, which... Uh, is about a bioinformatician based in Singapore. So I thought that was kind of interesting since there's some parallels with, with my life there. Um, but in, in this book, he, he talks about blockchains at some point. Um, and um, one of these uh, chains is called a biocoin, which the um, proof of work, we'll just call it that, is, is basically um, blocks are added as a result of some mutation happening in a bioreactor. And so there's some, there's some interesting... Uh, concept or idea here that if you could define a fitness function that you wanted to have a population of organisms move toward through directed evolution, that's some form of work because you're exploring the combinatorial space of the genome or the proteome or whatever aspect of the, these living systems that are evolving in parallel, right? You're trying to move towards some target and that's the work that you're establishing. If you have a way to measure that, you could actually link evolution to, um, to adding records onto, onto a chain. So this is maybe a way that we could do some interesting work, uh, but it re uh, as part of securing the chain, but it uh, it requires a much lower cost of genome sequencing and genome editing than we have today. But certainly in the future, if you look at the rate at which these things are are, are um, dropping in cost, it's conceivable some kind of technology like this could 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 exist. That's that's really fascinating. Um... I think we could probably spend the whole episode just exploring this topic. Uh, but uh, specifically, I, I, you know, I wanted to have you on to discuss uh, this, this initiative that Google has had of bringing the Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchain onto, uh, onto Google Cloud. Uh, but first, you know, tell us about your role at Google. What is it, uh, what, what's a typical day like as a science advocate at Google? Sure. So um, we can start with uh, by unpacking my title a little bit. So this is one that I just gave to myself because uh, my official title is as a developer advocate. Um, and I'm specifically interacting with communities who are involved in mostly physical sciences. And part of that is doing communication. And so this is more a title that resonates with them. So I usually just use that. Um, my day to day is, um, as I mentioned, communications. So doing interviews like this or uh, blogging or public speaking. This is maybe, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 percent of my time. About half of my time I spend uh, doing software development. So I'm actually an engineer at Google, but I happen to be externally facing, um, uh, showing people outside uh, what cloud can be used for to develop interesting applications and then collecting information from outside, seeing what the market is doing, what kind of cool stuff people are building, and in particular where they're encountering friction or, or where cloud doesn't have some specific offering yet, and then bringing that back into Google to um, help product teams to help us make better stuff for the people that we're trying to serve. Um, and then the remainder of my time is, you know, like everyone else, administrative kind of things, quite a lot of travel and email and et cetera. And so this, this avocation work that you do, is it mostly centered around cloud platform or do you also touch other Google products? It's, it's all cloud. Yeah. And I'm specifically building things that are more like end to end realistic use cases. And I'm working quite a lot with these public data sets, as we'll talk about later, I'm sure. Um, some of my, my colleagues are doing more like feature um, uh, uh, advocating about, you know, incremental updates on products. But I tend to build large integrated projects that are touching many possible cloud components. Hmm, interesting. And so, uh, you know, as, as you said, you, you, you build these projects that are sort of more realistic and that are sort of like experiments that could potentially turn into products. Has, has, have any of the things that you've worked on turned into, uh, you know, sort of morphed into Google products uh, or, or anything that has been commercialized? 
Uh, I give a lot of feedback to, um, so as a geneticist, I work quite a lot with the, the genomics and, and healthcare uh, product team. And yeah, definitely some of the stuff that, that I, I encounter, either fiction that I'm encountering as an individual developing with the tools, I'm basically like customer zero. Um, I give them that feedback and then stuff that's really bothering customers, I, I give that to them too. And then that, that results in updates to the products. Yeah, for sure. Sounds like a really fascinating role where you can, uh, you know, live your, 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 your passion for technology and science while experimenting and having sort of a, a lot of flexibility to propose new types of, uh, new types of experiments yeah, it's like internally. Yeah. People who love to play with new technology, um, they, they find themselves quite at home in this kind of role. And I uh, basically just to play with, get to play with like Lego bricks all day. It's fantastic. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so let's, let's talk about Google cloud platform at a high level. Uh, so I think most of our listeners will probably be familiar with Google Pla Cloud Platform. Uh, so, but you know, give us a high-level overview of that product and the types of components that exist within it. Okay, sure. Yeah, it's a public cloud. Um, so we have a bunch of data centers uh, and network connecting the data centers. It's uh, comparable to other public clouds in that regard. Um, Google's been operating its own data centers for 20, 20 years now. We just passed our, our 20th birthday. And so we know quite, about, quite a bit about how to operate these things. Um, the first cloud product was something called App Engine, which is, is still around, was a bit ahead of its time. Um, today, our uh, product areas, you could break it down roughly into three, three areas. One of them is related to virtualization and infrastructure. So this would be Kubernetes or, or other types of virtual machine um, services and microservices infrastructure, networking, firewalls, et cetera. Um, another area of product is related to applications development. So this would be for um, App Engine fits into there, for example, or um, other components for building, let's just say, web services and integrating all of your stuff together to make something usable. And then the final area is um, data and analytics. And this is the, the area where I'm advocating, uh, which is primarily big data technologies. So BigQuery is one of these, uh, BigTable, Spanner, um, are a bunch of our databases. Most, a lot, quite a lot of it's data, database related and, and storage. And then um, on storage, and then on the compute side, we have a whole bunch of AI technologies. And so, you know, you can't really compute if you don't have data, and data is not really useful if you don't have compute. So we, we have these two things that, that can move data back and forth between them to build new data from old data. Um, and the more, the more interesting types of services we have on the compute side are, are AI related. So give us a sense of how big this cloud computer is. I mean, I don't know what kind of metric we want to use if it's, whether it's a uh, number of data centers, number of computers, or, you know, petabytes of information processed. Uh, can you give us a sense of how massive the Google cloud is? Yeah, I, I can't give you like specific stats on the number of data centers, but I know that we have uh, we're represented in all the all the major geographies around the world and um, have uh, our own dedicated connection between the data centers. <clears throat> so the connectivity is quite good running through our dark fiber. It doesn't ever pass over the public Internet. Um, and then a lot of our services are because, again, it comes from this heritage of Google before Google Cloud. Um, we have built some services like Spanner, for example. So this is a, a uh, globally consistent uh, distributed database that relies on atomic clocks to make sure transactions are um, uh, allow these different data centers to be synchronized. And that's now available via public cloud as well. So there's a whole bunch of uh, like goodies from Google that are, that are inside of this public cloud. Um, there's a lot of big customers on here. Uh, Snapchat runs on Google Cloud, for example. If you remember uh, Pokemon Go, people still play this. That's also on Google Cloud. Um, Dropbox runs on Google Cloud. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of customers. Zillow runs on Google Cloud. They do, they do some interesting uh, AI stuff related to forecasting and, and image analysis of properties, uh, geospatial analysis. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite big, and we've got some major customers. Now, you mentioned the Google Cloud was uh, sort of this, this suite of, of services. So we've got the virtualization aspect, we've got the storage aspect, uh, and then also the data processing and uh, machine learning and AI. As, as a user of Google Cloud, I presume that you, know, you can sort of, the, all these products integrate together, correct? Yeah, yeah. There's some okay. places where some, you know, some components don't interact as seamlessly as you would like. Or to move data between them, but in general, there's some way for them to interoperate. 
Mm. So what, what are the, what are the, the most interesting things, the uh, most cutting edge things uh, that you've seen that you can talk about that people are doing, you know, in areas like, uh, like data processing or research or the types of things that people are doing with your AI modules? Oh, um, I would, I would recommend looking at a, another YouTube channel called two minute papers. This is, uh, a, they're usually a little bit more than two minutes, but they cover the, the latest advances in deep learning. And quite a lot of that is happening with a uh, application, sorry, an SDK called TensorFlow. And TensorFlow was developed by Google. It was open source. This is the largest, um, uh, largest, most popular um, library for doing deep learning, which is the, the current most popular um, uh, area of machine learning. And that's, uh, that's all compatible with Google Cloud. It all runs on Google Cloud. We've got specific services that make it run really, really well. Cloud Machine Learning Engine, um, for example. Um, yeah, there's computer vision is one of, the, one of the most interesting areas. You can see how computers are able to now drive cars, for example, right? So they're doing real-time analysis of images and looking at all the sensor data coming in and using that into the model of, of how the car is operating to make sure it can operate safely. So, so moving now towards more towards the the big query uh, component, um, can you spend a bit of time sp uh, describing big query and the and the different components there as it relates to what uh, what you're now doing with Bitcoin and Ethereum? Sure. So uh, big query is also a distributed system similar to Spanner as I mentioned earlier, but it's not um, distributed across multiple data centers like I was describing. It's it's living um, more locally than that but it still has a, a whole bunch of um, nodes that store parts of a data set. And so when you do a query, um, you're actually running a job in parallel across a large number of machines to uh, produce a result. And so we take the approach of basically having data center as computer um, and don't try to implement anything very fancy like indexes on the tables. We just do linear scan across everything because we have enough hard drives that it's, it's uh, economical enough to do that, uh, given we can distribute the workload well within the data center, and we're using AI to, to do that. Um, and because we're, we're not making any assumptions about the structure of the data set, it's quite workable for many different data sets of, of many different shapes and sizes and scales extremely well. You know, the Dutch have given us so much. Orange carrots, Bluetooth, artificial hearts, even donuts were invented by Dutch people. But they also gave us Dutch auctions, which as it turns out, are great for decentralized exchanges. Dutch X is a decentralized trading protocol for ERC-20 tokens, and it's invented, designed, and built by Gnosis. Current order book based exchanges, whether centralized or decentralized, have a couple of issues. Miners and exchanges can front run a trade when they step in front of a large order to gain an economic advantage. Not to mention issues with securing funds, high listing fees, lack of liquidity, and pricing efficiencies. The Dutch X exchange platform uses a Dutch auction mechanism to determine the fair value for a token. And participants in a trade are encouraged to reveal their true willingness to pay, which eliminates front running. As a permissionless on-chain protocol, it's useful for bots and other smart contracts needing to exchange tokens. And Dutch X also acts as an oracle for dApps requiring a price feed. So to learn more, check out the documentation at epicenter.tv slash Dutch X. Smart contracts are live on the Ethereum mainnet, so you can start building today. We'd like to thank Gnosis and DutchX for their support of Epicenter. So people are using BigQuery with their own data sets. So presumably all types of companies from, you know, um, companies processing consumer data to, you know, user, uh, user behavior data, you know, whatever types of data that the one can think of wanting to process, you could, you could presumably use BigQuery to hold that data and, and query the data to get you know, some some sort of uh, analysis, um, but there are also uh, public uh, data sets on, on on BigQuery, and this is uh, specifically in the context of what we're talking today. Quite interesting because there are, you know, I think, uh, you know, quite a few quite a few public data sets on there. Can you describe some of the other um, data sets that people are using on BigQuery? Yeah, there are. There's, uh, as you mentioned, there's, there's quite a lot of private data sets, uh, and then those can be joined against public data sets for, we could call it augmentation, for example, uh, where you might have some private information that you want to enhance or enrich by joining against public data. Um, the majority of the public data sets, though, are not um, 
not not dynamic, so they're not regularly updated. It's typically some kind of toy data set, like a there's one about the New York taxi cabs, and so there's a I forget how many days or months it is of data, but it's a, a snapshot or a sampling of taxi rides, what time the pickup happened, what time the drop off happened, and what was point A to point B. There's other ones that look at um, types of trees and shade coverage for doing solar radiation analysis on on city streets. Um, there's various image data sets. Um, there's one from, I forget which museum it's from, but a bunch of pieces of art are cataloged. Um, another data set I produced was a genomics data set uh, of a thousand different uh, cannabis genomes, where in order to accelerate innovation in, uh, in agriculture, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening right now with this new plant that is uh, undergoing regulatory changes. And so if we begin to look at the, the genetic structure of these plants, we might be able to uh, improve the varieties more quickly. Uh, so there's a whole, you know, hodgepodge of all kinds of different stuff, weather data, satellite imagery data. Um, uh, all of the Reddit comments are also in, um, in BigQuery. So if you wanted to query any of the, the subreddits and threaded forums, you can look at all of that. All of GitHub uh, is, in, is in BigQuery, not just the source code, but also the comments and the merge requests and everything. So if you wanted to do some Code analysis, that's a pretty popular one because, you know, developers are interested in development. Uh, so it gets quite a lot of quite a lot of use. I like this idea of combining private data sets and public data sets um, and, you know, some of the ways that one might use that. So, for example, tell me if this makes sense, like if you're a company like uh, like a ride sharing app uh, and you want to gain some insights as to the you know, ways people are using your app and specifically with regards to, uh, your competition, which are taxis, you know, you could you know, use that New York taxi ride data set and, you know, cross it with your own data set of like how your, uh, users are, are using your app, how many times, uh, a, a day or a week they're uh, booking rides and then maybe extract some, some insight from that so that you can. You know, perhaps you know, put more cars in a certain area uh, to better compete with with the New York taxis, for example. You know, what what are the types of examples can you point to as to how people are using you know public data sets you know with their own private uh, data sets? Sure. Yeah. Conceivably, that's possible. Although, um, bear in mind that this uh, taxi data set, let's we can keep working with this example, is um, is quite small and limited in in what it has. The yellow cab company is not putting all of their data into the public data set. It's just a little bit as a toy. Um, but that raises a, an interesting uh, possibility. What if all of the data were available? What would it, you know, what, how much would you have to um, pay to incentivize the company to put all their public data out there? Or at what level of uh, resolution would you, uh, would you be willing to pay for lower resolution data? And would they be willing to sell that as opposed to the, the highest resolution data? Um, and so, uh, there's actually an interesting uh, case study we can provide it as a supplement, possibly in the in the comments or something. Um, that's uh, Thomson Reuters did something like this, where they actually host their uh, headline data along with some other attributes. Uh, I don't know if it's the full article or or what. I've not looked at it. It's a private data set, and what they're doing is they're using Google uh, Data Exchange to make this available using Google's access control. Um, so Google basically allows them to manage the access control and is managing BigQuery tables to store the data such that Thomson Reuters has to, only takes the responsibility to put the data in, and then they're selling um, subscription access to get access to these tables. Um, so you, you could do this. You could also um, put data into, into, into queues for real-time uh, streaming analysis. So that's an example of where um, you know, we can now generalize out to not just two data sets, but actually having the notion of a marketplace. And maybe there's some opportunity for uh, transportation or logistics companies to bring it back to Yellow Cab, um, where they could be willing to operate by exchanging some or all of their data and pricing it accordingly, depending on, you know, how much of you need access to, how uh, much latency you're willing to accept, um, et cetera. So turning all those knobs that uh, it, it all is possible in, in a marketplace uh, design. You could think about ad tech as doing a very similar thing, right? Like advertising and ad exchanges. It's it's quite a similar idea. Interesting. Well, maybe we can come back to some other examples uh, a bit later, later on in, in the in the show. So let's um, let's talk about this uh, this Bitcoin blockchain data set on on Big Cloud. So this was this came out in February uh, of this year. 
Um, so what was so what 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 exactly does it include? So what is the Bitcoin data set on uh, on Google Cloud on on BigQuery? And what was the goal in making this data set publicly available? I wanted to be able to explore the data. This is sort of in my own selfish interest to be able to make some blog posts or just look at the data. Because uh, I know other developers who are wanting to do this too. You certainly see a lot of interest in, in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and any of these keywords. They're all growing over time, right? It's like, okay, there's developers here. I can go and become one of these developers and uh, draw some attention to Google Cloud. And I know we have good AI tools. So blockchain plus AI should be like super exciting, right? Um, so I tried to do some of these queries, and it turned it out to be really difficult to talk to a Bitcoin node directly. And uh, usually the kind of query I'd want to do would be some kind of historical analysis, and that's not possible just going uh, block by block very easily. You have to query one by one by one, whereas normally in a SQL type of scenario, you, you do uh, like a group by to, to aggregate. It's a particular type of operation for this kind of programming. Um, and so... Um, I realized that I could extract these data out of the Bitcoin data set and put them into BigQuery and, and do these analysis I wanted to do. And so uh, that's what's in there. It's nothing more than the Bitcoin uh, blockchain data itself. So we download all of the, the blocks. It's uh, about 200 gigabytes worth of data and then parse each of the blocks and load it into, into BigQuery. So every time a new block comes out, we update the table and put it in there. It's just the transaction data. I don't know how much your listeners would be familiar with what's in Bitcoin, but it's really just um, some addresses are sending some number of Satoshis from address A to address B. Right. So I'm looking at this right now. So I'm, uh, we'll link to the show no in the show notes to the uh, to the BigQuery uh, Bitcoin data set. So it actually has two tables. So it has a blocks table and a transactions table, correct? Yep. That's right. Okay. And the transaction, those are actually identical tables. Um, the reason I, I did that is I denormalized it because um, the way the BigQuery pricing model works is that you're paying for unit of IO. And if I unnest the blocks, I allow access to the transactions at a lower cost. So it saves the users money to do it that way. Okay, that makes sense. Right. So rather than querying simply the uh, the Rather than having to query the block and then find the transactions within the block, then you can simply query transactions. Yes, correct. That's right. Okay. Exactly. Interesting. And so you update this every every time a block is confirmed? Every block. Um, we're staying intentionally six blocks behind height because that allows us to avoid having to deal with chain reorgs. We don't want to have to delete data. There's some complexity, right? Because if you add a block and that ends up not being the real chain and just like some kind of dead branch on the chain, um, you don't want to have to then delete that and manage, manage that. Um, you'd rather, if you're going to build the simplest possible system, you'd, you don't want to take that into consideration. And so by staying several blocks behind the tip of the chain, you can avoid that problem. But the trade-off is then the data are slightly stale. Okay, so you're, you're not storing orphaned uh orphan chains or orphan block correct yeah none of the branches on the blockchain that don't end up becoming part of the main trunk are not stored in the table okay interesting is there a particular reason why you chose not to also store that data it seems like there could potentially be some interesting analysis that could be made on uh, on on this on orphan blocks um, well, any, any data that's on an orphan block is not part of the consensus, right? There was some minority thought there might be a block there that everyone would agree to, but due to race conditions or randomness or whatever, it just ended up not, not being the case. Um, looking at what transactions end up on these dead branches, yeah, it could be interesting. Maybe, maybe there's some censorship happening on the blockchain where somebody's blocking, you know, entity A is blocking entity B's transactions from being placed on chain by denial of service attacking them i suppose so yeah it could be interesting i have not i have not gone down that direction <laughs> that's, that's a real that's actually a really cool idea though yeah I, mean, I was thinking sort of along those lines right i mean if if, if at some point that were to become be the case perhaps you know, we could detect those types of anal anomalies with, on this data set in particular i think it would be interesting to if there was uh, some geospatial data or ip address data which is not stored on the chain right but you can see that from the mempool if you're operating a node. And is there some like relationship between 
IP addresses and can, can, can you basically see an adversarial relationship between peers where they try to block one another? Interesting. And there's probably some interesting patterns in there if, if that does happen. So you're, not, you're also not storing mempool transactions. Uh, at any point, I can't like query big uh, this data set and say, okay, what are the transactions waiting to be confirmed? It's only That's confirmed correct. blocks, six blocks after height. Correct. No mempool in BigQuery data set. That's correct. Okay, cool. So can you talk a bit about the technical infrastructure that you've built in order to, um, in order to query the blockchain and pull this data into your data set? Sure. Do you want to talk about just Bitcoin or do you want to get into Ethereum? How do you want to... Uh, let, let, let's talk about Bitcoin this. for the moment and then we can talk about Ethereum a bit later. Okay. Yeah, sure. So for the Bitcoin... Um, Bitcoin infrastructure, what we did is we built a custom Bitcoin client with a library called Bitcoin J. So this is the Java version that implements the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Um, and it, it's a peer on the, on the network like any other peer, and it accepts uh, new blocks coming in. And if a peer asks for a block, it will send the blocks out. But we're not doing any mining. We're just acting as sort of like a file sharing node, like a BitTorrent node, basically, um, storing the blockchain. And then uh, we know when new blocks are coming in because we're accepting these new files, right, block files. And um, we're looking at what the height is of the chain. And every time a, uh, a block comes in, we increment this follower position that's X blocks behind and then kick off a job uh, using something called cloud functions that will grab that block from cloud storage. So there's the, there's the node that's running a compute engine instance. It's a virtual machine, so it's just like a computer. Um, uh, no special mining hardware, because we're not mining. And then it writes the block file to storage. And then there's a, a function that watches that storage uh, area for a new file to have come in, and it processes that file and sticks it into BigQuery. That's it, that's all it does. So you essentially have a node that's listening to the network uh, that pulls in transactions and then stores them to, in, into BigQuery where they can then be queried. And so the, the, big, the BigQuery, as, as, uh, as a user, uh, how do I query it? How do I query the blockchain? Uh, what, what language am I using? Are there APIs or sort of SDKs that I can plug into my software to query the Bitcoin blockchain? Yeah, so we're using a language called SQL or SQL. Um, this is an uh, industry standard language for interacting with databases. So Oracle database runs SQL and, you know, um, MySQL, Postgres, uh, Microsoft, Access, and all of that. It's, a, it's an industry standard thing. Teradata, all of them use, uh, they support some core uh, SQL um, uh, words or functions, you could say, like operators. And then typically there's some vendor specific extensions. So BigQuery has some vendor specific extensions too related to AI, geospatial, various other things. Um, but for working with the, the blockchain data, you don't really need to have any vendor specific extensions. You could conceivably take the, the loading system and push it into MySQL and it would all work in the same way. Okay, so you could construct a query as simple as you know, select all transactions from this day to this day where uh, the amount transacted was like one Bitcoin, for example, and it would just return all of those uh, all of those transactions uh, in in a result. Yep. Okay. Yep. Interesting. You could select the um, the mean price of a transaction per day across all days, or you could look at the quartiles or max or variance or whatever attribute you're looking to. If we continue on with this per day example, you could partition by day. You could partition by block. I mean, there's there's sort of many different ways you could slice it. And then maybe you could correlate it with some other you know, public uh, public data set like weather and try to see if there's any like patterns that are affecting people's transaction volumes or something like that. For sure. So uh, while we were preparing for this episode, you you mentioned uh, this platform called Kaggle, which I, I'd sort of heard of before, but you know wasn't super familiar with it. So um, the way you described it to me is, is sort of this uh, is. Um, it's GitHub for data analysis. So it's a, it's a platform where data scientists can um, share their their data analyses. I, I presume sort of like uh, queries and code, uh, and you know they can fork them. And uh, it's sort of this open uh, platform where this open community uh, of uh, of data scientists. Um, talk about some of the things that people are doing on Kaggle. Things that you may have noticed um, with regards to these data sets. 
what type of analyses are people doing on, on the Bitcoin blockchain? Uh, yeah, so Kaggle is it's the largest uh, community of, of data scientists uh, online. So there's quite a lot of machine learning happening there. Um, they analyze in these notebook environments. So there's a computer sitting behind a interactive form in a web browser, and they can run code against data that's sitting on a remote machine that's connected to the web via the via the web browser. Um, and it can also connect to BigQuery. So they can pull data into this analysis environment and process it with uh, code inside of this notebook environment. They're typically programming in, in Python. Um, specifically in, in, in regards to the, the Bitcoin data set, um, users have mostly been interested in, in looking at these features that we were just talking about, like prices of transactions denominated in Satoshis or what were the largest transactions per day and then um, correlating these to other data sets. So they like to uh, link against other private data. So for example, as part of the Bitcoin data set, as you mentioned, we just have the blocks and the transactions. It's really just the chain data, right? But um, since this is all financial stuff, frequently people wanna link against financial data. And so they'll bring in some other tables. They may host it in their own BigQuery tables, or they may be uploading a CSV as part of, the, um, part of their analysis. And then they can start doing, you know, pricing type analyses over time. Interesting. So then, what 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 people are an, uh, analyzing is the Bitcoin transaction uh, data, and then crossing that data with other could be, you know, financial data. For example, if one wanted to see if there's any correlation between like the Nasdaq uh, financial indexes or uh, Dow Jones. Uh, with uh, the price of Bitcoin, for example, well, I suppose no, the price of Bitcoin wouldn't because it's not uh, it's not in your data set. But you know, one could make that that type of analysis using um, using the the BigQuery language, you know, perhaps combined with like some machine learning stuff. Yep. Yeah. Ex auxiliary tables that are available elsewhere. The whole I think there's there's you know the the more data that you can link together that's structured and documented and linkable the more value that comes out. And it's not just one plus one equals two. It's more like, well, it's not two plus two equals, how would I say? Three plus three equals six. It's three times three equals nine, right? Your utility of the data is more of a product of the pieces as opposed to uh, the sum. If you've listened to previous episodes with Marley Gray and Matt Kerner, you know that Microsoft is committed to providing enterprise grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers. Well, the Azure Blockchain Workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks. Take the Ethereum Proof of Authority template, for example. It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible Proof of Authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure, so you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, check out aka.ms slash epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. So recently, there was a blog post that was published uh, sometime in August that announced that Google's also um, releasing an Ethereum data set uh, yep. that's now available on BigQuery. So what has the reception been like? It's uh, been initially very positive. This is only uh, a few weeks ago now, not even a month yet. Uh, but the numbers are looking good in terms of utilization and number of uh, inbound inquiries. I get a lot of basically direct pings from developers because my, my name is out there. I'm on Twitter, et cetera. And when they, you know, some fraction of them want to talk to me about things they're interested in doing. And uh, relative to the Bitcoin data set, the amount of developer activity has been very high. So I expect that the utilization of the Ethereum data public data set will be, will be even larger than the Bitcoin public data set. Yeah, the Bitcoin one, um, it's been regularly heavily scanned ever since it was released. So it's a very popular public data set. Um, and presumably people are acquiring this public data set to link against their private private data, right? To do, I don't know what they're trying to do, something. 
analyze it for some purpose. Um, uh, the Ethereum one, because it's such a large developer community, though, I think there's going to be many more different, there's going to be more variety of applications and maybe even more, more volume of applications on this one, just because it's a lot more complex. So what are the unique challenges that, uh, that you face in implementing the Ethereum data set as opposed to, to Bitcoin? Because, I mean, the Bitcoin data set, it, it seems quite, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's a simple feat, but it seems quite simple, right? You've got a node, it pulls transactions, there's some, pro, you know, like some data processing in these transactions to normalize the data, and then it's put into, a, it's put into a, essentially a SQL database. And with Ethereum, there's a bit more to it. There's the transactions, but there's also a smart, a smart contract uh transactions and yes. sort of token transactions and there's a whole bunch of other things that go into that uh, that you know add some complexities you know can you can you talk about those and how you've uh overcome those challenges yeah so as you said bitcoin data set is really just um you know transfers and then the cost of the transfer that the the requester was willing to pay for that transaction right and there's some strange like obfuscation where there's change addresses and intentional uh, obfuscation of who's really paying whom as part of like a pseudo private design. Uh, Ethereum doesn't have that, so this analysis of where money is flowing to is is not a problem in Ethereum. But there's this other difficulty where where um, there can be data that go along with a transaction, and that could be a smart contract or other types of data. Um, and this that's that's really the core complexity is you've got this Ethereum virtual machine that takes inputs that go into some compiled code that lives at an address on the, on the blockchain that can do things with that input, those input bytes that are going along with the transaction that are coming in. And what those smart contracts do with those input bytes is arbitrarily complex. It's a, it's a Turing machine. So dealing with representing that complexity is very difficult, um, which is why it was it took a lot longer to to um, get the Ethereum data set released than the, than the Bitcoin data set. So token transfers that's a that's a that's a great example. Um, the the infrastructure for the Ethereum um, uh, data set is pretty similar. So we're operating an Ethereum node and it's writing out some files into cloud storage, but um, it, uh, it 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 deviates from the Bitcoin design there where um, the the loading is happening not just as a direct insertion into BigQuery, but there's um, another another cloud component called uh, Cloud Composer. So this is based on uh, an open source project called Apache Airflow that you can define uh, an ETL pipeline. So ETL is a, a term used in data warehousing. Basically, everything we're talking about today is data warehousing and then analysis on the stored data. So ETL is for extract, transform, and load. And basically, you're extracting data from the Ethereum node. You're transforming it to some form that will be useful for users. So it could be, you know, reading the transactions and parsing them so that you can see if it's a ERC-20 transfer or not, or ERC-721 transfer, or whatever other kind of smart contract function call. And then the load part is putting it into the, into the tables. And so there's a whole bunch of additional ETL processing that we're doing as part of loading the Ethereum data into the BigQuery because we don't just want to load the transactions where we give the only the bytes that were the input and then they go to some smart contract, but we don't tell you what did that mean. There's no, um, at, at, at face value, there's really no analysis that's uh, interesting analyses that are enabled by only giving input bytes. You actually have to look at what the smart contracts are doing. And so we're looking at these things called traces and uh, logs that are emitted by the smart contracts as part of their operation. So they, they have some events that are coming out that describe what the smart contract is doing. And so we're putting all of that into some tables too so that you can, you can look at those and aggregate on the, the effects of the smart contract on the network. Can you go into a bit more detail about how you perform these analyses uh, on, on these traces and logs? Uh, yeah, sure. So this is getting pretty far down into the weeds of how Ethereum works, but um, smart contracts, they have these functions that are defined in, in typically Solidity. Um, and a given function will have um, some defined inputs. An input could be like a, an address, or it could be an amount, or it could be um, other random binary data. And then they do something with this data, and um, 
what they're doing is uh, the result of that is being emitted as events typically. And so what we're doing is we're, we're um, taking those events and putting them into a table so you can, so you can observe it. Um, an example would be, uh, and the input is actually very difficult. It's, it's difficult to understand because it's, it's a binary string. It's a bunch of bytes and you need to segment the bytes according to the function specification. So there's like all this array manipulation and very low level stuff that's not really relevant to the business purpose of making a query or an analysis that you have to do in order to be able to do the query or the analysis. And so really what we're doing is we're, we're factoring out all of this um, menial labor that a developer would have to do, doing it once and doing it correctly, and then nobody has to work on that problem again. If they're okay, willing to you know, run their operations on BigQuery. So the Ethereum blockchain contains the data is contained there. So within the input bytes of the smart contract, you know, we 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 have we have the information there. For example, perhaps some address data or the the uh, the function call um, hash. Uh, yep. And what you're doing is you're extracting that data from essentially just sort of like a blob of bytes and uh, making it available in this query format so that now you might be able to say, okay, what are all the contracts that are calling this specific function? Correct. Or what are the transactions that are calling to this specific function in this contract? Uh, and, and making it easily available, whereas if you wanted to do that by yourself, you would have to build it um, from scratch. Yeah, we're just re reformatting the data, right? It's in this, it's in this form um, that... Uh, uh, is just difficult to difficult to access for doing certain types of analyses. It's designed for usability by the Ethereum blockchain software, right? Ethereum peer-to-peer -peer network is is concerned with consensus and concerned with the efficiency of transactions and concerned with the operations of the Ethereum virtual machine in the blockchain, right? But it's not concerned with, hey, what if somebody wants to do some historical analysis on all the data in here? That's irrelevant from the point of view of a database. If somebody was to design a database that is for transactions, then you would design it in a particular way. If you had a database you wanted for analysis, you would design that in a almost like the, you would call it the opposite way. And if you get into data warehousing um, uh, theory, there's these are the two extremes of different types of database design. One's called an OLTP. It's an online transaction processing database. Um, the canonical example is usually like a hotel or an airline reservation system. It's very concerned with transactional integrity and very concerned with uh, uh, throughput, number of transactions per unit time. But it doesn't really concern itself with analyzing like price trends of the hotel rooms or the flights, right? But you can take that transactional data and uh, reformat it into an online analytics uh, processing system, which is an OLAP database, which denormalizes it, doesn't care about transactions, but tries to structure the data in such a way that it's easy to send any arbitrary query against it and get reasonable performance for the query when you want to get the data back to a business application or an analyst or something like that. So at a higher level, that's what we're doing with these blockchain data. We're taking OLTP data. It's optimized by the OLTP system, i.e. the blockchain system, for transaction throughput, and we reformat it, and we make it available as OLAP. Okay, so I, 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 it occurs to me that an OLTP system is like Bitcoin, but without mutability. Bitcoin does not have mutability. Yeah, these OLTPs can be. Uh, yeah, so if you remove, if you add an immutability constraint to an OLTP, you get a blockchain. Sure, you could say it like that. Okay. What type of analyses have you been doing uh, on this uh, on the Ethereum data sets? In the, in the blog post, there's a couple of examples there. Can you talk about those? Yeah, one of the examples, I mean, some of them are time series examples uh, where we're looking at, uh, you know, number of transactions per day. And that's a very obvious kind of thing to do. Um, what interests me more, though, is the um, characteristics of actors on the network. Um, or I guess interactors, you could say, because wallets aren't doing anything on their own on Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these block, any other blockchains. There's always some interacting partner, right? And that interaction between those two partners tells you something about um, uh, 
it's some measurable observation. And if you look at um, multiple of these observations in aggregate for one address or groups of addresses over time, you can start to quantify what they're doing and assign attributes to the, to the addresses. So you could begin to identify, as a concrete example, you could identify um, exchanges, for example, uh, because they're typically going to have uh, large volumes flowing in and out of them, and they'll typically have many, many interacting partners of uh, other wallets sending, um, sending money or tokens um, in or out. Now, there could be other um, addresses in the network that aren't exchanges or aren't known exchanges um, that have similar behavior, but uh, we could use a duck typing approach to, to characterize those. I mean, if it, looks like an ex if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it smells like a duck, it's probably a duck. So you could start to label exchanges that are unknown based solely on their attributes by looking at their behavior over time. Um, mining pools would be another example. You can start to pick those out and you can imagine, you know, what kind of characteristics a pool would have or a miner who is time sharing inside of a pool. They'll have a particular type of characteristic, right? They're going to receive deposits periodically. Um, and only after um, the mining pool um, mines a block, right? So that sort of thing is very interesting to me because it relates very very much to the type of work I was doing in my dissertation as a graduate student. I was looking at genetic networks, and particularly the human, human, human genome network, um, which is composed of genes that are interacting with one another to operate a cell, which is basically a distributed, parallel, highly parallel distributed system of these you know, molecules that are interacting with another to process information. And uh, there's a whole bunch of analytical techniques that can be used uh, that come from biostatistics for analyzing these biological networks, you can analyze financial networks with the same techniques. And it turns out some of these guys doing anti-money laundering applications or other types of like fraud analytics or, uh, you know, forensic accounting, they're also very interested in this kind of stuff, but they don't necessarily have the, um, the level of sophistication the biologists do because the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health has been throwing a lot of dollars at, you know, curing cancer for a long time, which is where a lot of the why a lot of these methods were developed because cancer is a disease of the genetic program. I feel like I'm kind of like getting off on some tangents here and rambling, but there's some very direct connection like between the math and the methods of what I was doing as a graduate student and this stuff that's happening with blockchain right now, and not the blocks of the consensus themselves, but the interaction between the entities on the network. That's what I'm interested in. Well, um, feel free to elaborate. Uh, I think that's a really fascinating topic. So Yeah, well, I, mean, we, we, I just gave you two examples, one of them being identifying exchanges, the other one being identifying um, mining pools or, or um, timeshare miners. Um, I don't know, what other sorts of interesting patterns would you want to look for? Well, well, there was one uh, example here in the blog post that I thought was, was kind of interesting, and that's uh, analyzing the functionality of smart contracts. Uh, can you, can you uh, dive into that one? Yeah, sure. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, because so, so as you mentioned earlier, there's these hashes of the functions, right? And each function has its own signature. Um, if you are to um, consider a function as having some set of, uh, a smart contract as having some set of functions available to it, where it's between zero functions to whatever, all possible functions in the hash space, four billion functions. Um, and every smart contract has some subset of that zero to four billion, you can define a distance metric or a similarity metric between any two contracts that tells you how similar they are in the, the functions that they implement. So it's reasonable to say that if, if two smart contracts have the same functions available, um, probably what they do is, if not the same, quite similar. Uh, so all ERC-20s implement um, four methods. And so you could find all ERC-20 um, contracts by checking to see if the contract implements those four methods. That's actually how we do this in the, in the, the database. There's a table that documents specifically ERC-20 transfers, and there's a table that lists all smart contracts. And there's a Boolean column on that smart contract table which says, is ERC-20 or is ERC-721? Because these are the two you know, dominant um, smart contract types 
And so we, we just kind of add as a convenience the analysis, pre-analyze to save developers some time so they can only restrict analysis to those smart contracts. But you could do it for any arbitrary, you know, set of functions you're interested in. All the data are there. Right. So for, for any standardized um, uh, smart contract, uh, such as the token contract or the, um, the 721, ARC 721 uh, contract, you can essentially just look at the transaction, uh, look at the uh, function hashes in the contract and determine whether or not uh, that's in fact, you know, this type of transaction or not. Uh, that's right. And then you're putting yeah. that, you're, you're making that data available so that you, you don't have to, you don't have to extract that data yourself. It's already made available for you in the BigQuery uh, st data set. Yep. And I define a function for the similarity metric we were just describing. Um, there's an analysis like this that's done as one of the examples in the blog post where I show the original um, CryptoKitties contract and you can see all of the subsequent um, iterations where they, they basically upgrade the contract and they're all similar to one another because they're adding functions over time. And then you can also see clones because the CryptoKitties uh, contract is open source. You can see somebody made crypto puppies and crypto clowns and other you know, variants of this thing. It's basically a clone of the game using the same code. Um, and it shows up as a very similar contract. So if you have some you know, game that you like to play, like let's say you like to play any of these you know, Connect 3 jewel games, Candy Crush or something, you could find all other Candy Crush-like games on the blockchain because they would have similar functionality. I think I saw this in, in one of your talks uh, that you gave um, in Singapore recently. I'll try to find a link and, and add it to the show notes. Uh, but there was this analysis of the uh, frequency that smart contracts were, that specific contracts were called and the token contract, I mean, I guess, um, overshadowed everything else. But then there was one one contract which uh, more recently had yes. gained uh, quite a bit of uh, <laughs> uh, volume and that was the crypto kitties uh, contract yeah contract. it had a very brief spike and i think probably most of your listeners will remember that the the ethereum uh, blockchain like you couldn't add transactions to it it was clogged up and a bunch of icos had to d delay because there was a crypto kitty craze right yeah but erc the erc20 uh, transfer function is the most common one or has been i haven't looked at the data recently but i would imagine it's still it's still quite uh quite uh, common. yeah of course uh, i'm sure it still is um one one area that i wanted to dive into is uh so we mentioned earlier that uh, the google cloud services are integrated um so you know we can we can um we can essentially connect different services so what are the types of analyses that uh, one could make, uh, I, I figure there's some actually quite powerful analyses that you can make using um, the, the AI component of Google Cloud with, some, with the Ethereum transaction data. Have you thought about you know, the types of things that one could infer from, uh, from this data by you know, plugging in a machine learning algorithm and doing some deep learning on this transaction data? Yeah, so I, I am actively thinking about that. And so the, the data that are in BigQuery, um, there is a couple of first order things that you can do just with the, the data as they are today. Um, you could look at the input bytes going into, into, into transactions and begin to reason about uh, what the functionality of a contract might be or an un, a function, function signature that you don't know what it does, but you see what its inputs are you could identify uh, round numbers, or you could identify addresses, and this would give you some hint as to what that function is likely to be to be doing without getting into analysis of the of the the stack trace of the virtual machine. You can also um, analyze the smart contracts themselves, right? Because these are all some byte code, and you can um, treat each of those bytes as as features and uh, train some kind of analyzer to classify contracts. It would probably be something quite similar to what we were just talking about of finding similar similar contracts, but would have some uh, additional ability to detect other things that are, are difficult to do with such a simple method. Um, but um, the more interesting methods, you can't really do them. So let's come back to, you know, I was talking about networks and, and network analysis. You can't really do network analysis on the BigQuery data set directly because um, network analyses require um, traversals through the network. So this basically would mean in scan it, like looking at uh, a table that is set up for scanning. We talked about BigQuery being a scanning system earlier. It um, you would have to basically 
have random access and do these recursive queries, which it's not really very well suited to that. It's well suited for linear scans. And so in order to do these analyses that involve um, uh, traversing the network, you need to move them into another type of database called a graph database. And so what's beginning to happen now, this is me and some other data scientists, uh, in, in the open source space, we're exploring this. Um, and there's a, another link we can put in the supplement to some work by one of my collaborators. Um, we're loading data into graph databases, uh, analyzing it, reducing the um, graph down to something like a single measurement per address or per transaction, allowing us to uh, assign a value between zero and one of the probability of this thing being an exchange, for example. And then taking those attribute data from the graph database, putting them back into BigQuery, so then it becomes, um, we would call it a vector of features. This is getting kind of very specific into machine learning now. But these, these machine learning models typically want to operate on something called a vector space model. So they want the, every observation to be a row. But what I just told you is like, in order to work with the network data, it's not row-like in nature. It's graph-like in nature. But you can reduce the graph down to rows by going out to a graph database. So iterating between the data warehouse and a graph database to create more elements in the um, in the data warehouse, basically doing enrichment through analysis of the graph enables the um, these AI algorithms to begin analyzing the graph. So that's the the direction that we are we are moving right now. And fortunately, you know, Google Cloud has good technologies for building graph databases as well. So we're secure there, um, but it requires a, a, a lot of work. You mentioned earlier that uh, that the Reddit. Uh, the entire entirety of Reddit was also in the uh, as a as a public data set in uh, in Google Cloud. Yeah, it, it occurs to me that you know we might be able to do some sort of analysis as well as to the success of an ICO, for example. So take all the ICOs, you know, since since you know two two or three years ago, uh, look at the amount of money raised, and then may, perhaps correlate that with some natural lang language processing. Uh, data that you would have extracted from like Reddit communities uh, and maybe some other data in there and come up with some kind of predictive model to determine you know, what types of characteristics, what kind of like characteristics of communities that you, know, you might look for uh, in order to determine whether an ICO will be like, you know, successful or not or this type of thing. Yeah, totally. So um, Reddit actually was presenting at the uh, Google Cloud uh, Next conference over over the summer, talking about what they're doing to analyze some of the activity to build. Um, they're trying to basically help people find more content on Reddit so they can continue, you know, living out their happy Reddit life. But yeah, you can use um, uh, this type of technology called natural language processing. It's a type of AI that tries to understand natural language, like the Google Assistant. You might see this on your phone or Siri or um, uh, Google Duplex or Google Home. You've probably seen these like conversational agents, right? Bots. Um, so you can you can take some text or speech to text, and then take the text um, and send it into an AI and extract things like, hey, what were the key, um, what was the key object that was being talked about here, or what was the sentiment being expressed about that object, and quantifying it, basically reducing the human readable text down to some numbers. And then you could correlate, you could then cross-reference those numbers. So back to your example, like, okay, was it more important to the success of a project that there was a lot of positive sentiment? Or was it more important that there was just a lot of buzz in general, even though a whole bunch of it was negative? Maybe there's, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but you could begin to explore that this kind of line of reasoning by linking the, um, yeah, the Reddit data set to the, uh, to the Bitcoin or, Bitcoin or, or Ethereum data set. Could make for a real interesting uh, PhD thesis. Thesis. <laughs> I would, you know, love to support any data scientist who wants to work on this. Please, if you know anybody listening wants to work on that, shoot me an email or join us, join up on Kaggle, or you know, let's get the data analysis going. I, I can see something like analyzing memes. You know, like analyzing also uh, like uh, this type of like Dogecoin memes. Uh, you know, like how many how many times are people sharing a specific meme? Does that have an impact on on communities on on, uh, <laughs> yeah, on the success of ICO or something of that nature. I mean, we even have this um, Vision API, which is it's a sibling of the language API that can actually look at images and analyze those and tell you what's in the image and you know what's the general sentiment about that. 
yeah <laughs> for sure cool so um looking into the future are there any plans to uh to release other uh other tokens, blockchains, or cryptocurrency as on uh, on the open uh, platform. Uh, I'm looking at a bunch of other stuff right now. Yeah, uh, more more of these public blockchain data. Um, it's all just sitting there in, in its public data sets, and uh, you know these current ones of getting getting a bunch of good traction analysis. Um, yeah, that would be interesting to do. Um, the um, I think the Ethereum data set has, has quite a lot of mileage to be gotten out of it, though. It's just, it's just so deep and interesting, and there are... And I've, I, I've not done any plot of, of developer activity versus, I don't know, market cap or anything like that, but I would imagine Ethereum would be a real outlier. That, that, that community has done a good job of, of making ecosystem components available and being very supportive of their developers, and so there's just a, it's just very vibrant compared to... Uh, a lot of the other projects, even though Bitcoin is, you know, bigger by market cap, uh, it doesn't, it didn't, it didn't really attract as much. Um, uh, didn't, I didn't get as many inbound inquiries about that data set as I did for um, for the Ethereum data set. Well, Alan, this is all very fascinating. I want to thank you for coming on the show and talking about this. Uh, I think uh, that I think there's a lot of interesting things to be built on top of these data sets, and you know, we we kind of mentioned this before the show, but in in some ways. Uh, this data is meant to be public, right? And a lot, a lot of companies yeah. out there have sort of made their business model upon these data sets. I mean, like block explorers, uh, companies that do you know blockchain analysis, like their entire business models are built on what is essentially a public data set, but where the blockchain itself doesn't really have um, the underlying infrastructure that allows just anyone to make these really you know, complex, well, actually quite simple queries on, on top of them. We've had to build all this mm -hmm. other uh, infrastructure on top. So the fact that Google is making this available to the public uh, is is really great. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what kind of applications or what kind of research comes out of this in the future. Yeah, that's what we're here to do. We're here to help developers make uh, cool applications. Great. So we will add, uh, I've got a ton of links to add to the show notes. So everything we've talked about, uh, the blog posts, uh, the links to the actual data sets and some of the other articles that we mentioned during the show or will be in the show notes. Uh, so thank you for our listeners for tuning in. Uh, you can get new episodes of Epicenter every week by subscribing to us on YouTube, SoundCloud, you know, your favorite podcast app, whether that be on iTunes or Android. Uh, we will soon be on Spotify. That is going to be finalized in the next couple of weeks. I know that people have been asking for that and it took a while, but we're finally going to be on Spotify. So uh, we'll be uh, we'll be tweeting that out as soon as uh, as soon as that uh, becomes the case. That's where I'll be listening. Um, That's great. Great. Awesome. Uh, we're also on Google Play. Uh, for those who don't who don't know that, we're also on, on Google Play Music. Uh, and uh, if you want to support the show, well, we love to hear from you uh, by getting iTunes reviews. Uh, it helps people find the show and we're always happy to see your reviews there. So thanks so much. We look forward to being back next week.